live stream. Okay, we are live streaming this class, so um, thank you all for being here. As always, week after week, our learning together brings me a great deal of satisfaction and joy, and I hope it does the same for you. Let's begin with our bracha, baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kichanu mitzvotav etivanu, asof divrei Torah. Okay. Um, before we jump into the actual verse that we're going to be looking at today, what I want to do is I want to share my screen with you. Um, it's going to take a second. Okay. Um, can everybody see where it says um, Safari Leviticus 23? Yes, you can all yeah. see that? Yeah. Okay. So I want you just to take a minute um, and quickly read through, as I scroll it, chapter 23 of Leviticus, and note, if anything, what is striking to you. What seems to be, I'm going to give you even a greater hint, out of place. So... This is one of the times in which the Torah lists all of the major holidays. So God says to Moshe, Moshe, these are the fixed times which you shall proclaim as sacred occasions. Usually a sacred occasion is like Shabbat or the first and last days of Pesach or Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, a holiday that has with it certain restrictive elements to it. Unlike Purim or Hanukkah, which are not considered sacred occasions. So the first one, obviously, is the Shabbat. And he talks about what to do on the Shabbat. Then after the Shabbat, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, all right, I'll stop and you guys can just quickly read through it. I don't know if that was too fast or too slow, but did you get a gist of what's going on here? Um, Lior, I just realized that I should have put them all in Hebrew also. I'm sorry. Um, okay, what, what, what's, what's happening here? What did you see? Yeah, Ruthann, unmute yourself. Um, I'm not sure because I was having trouble keeping up. Um, 
but I, 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 does it have something to do with the sacrifices being brought to the temple or not? Um, there was a little mention of the sacrifices, that's true, but that's not the gist of the whole piece. Oh, but there okay. are sacrifices that are part of the practice of what's going on here. Oh, isn't it the, the date and the time of the year and exactly what they're going to be doing and um, how they're going to be doing it and why they're going to be doing good. it and what's going to happen to them if they don't do it? Okay, and, good. Good. So what you have here, as Lauren said, is a list of all the holidays and then the practices associated with those holidays. Um, if I went too fast, I'm sorry. But what were the holidays that you noticed that were mentioned in this chapter 23? Well, I didn't see Shavuot. I don't know. It's here. It it's was here. Okay. It was it was. Um, um, right here. Thank you. And it comes after this whole thing about the sacrifices and two loaves of bread and elevation and the day in which the sheaf of elevation is offered. Um, and that came right at before, after the seven days of Pesach. Yeah. And we know Day of Atonement came and... Day of Atonement and was there in, also. And the boot and staying in the boot and... Uh, Good. Sukkot and excellent. So we start with Shabbat, right? That's the first one. We start with Shabbat, and then after Shabbat, we go to Pesach, and then after Pesach, we go to elevating the sheaf, um, and that leads us, and then offering some kind of choice flour and doing it for seven weeks. And then after that, on the 50th day, bringing two uh, loaves of bread and celebrating the holiday of Shavuot. That's right here, verse 21. And then after that, then you've got Rosh Hashanah. And then you've got Yom Kippur. And then you've got Sukkot. So um, what do you think of all that? A lot to remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to remember because you get to read it every year in the Torah. And then on the holidays, we actually read that section on a regular basis. Um, anything strike you as interesting, unusual? And I know that we I had you go through it fairly quickly. It's interesting to me that in every case, they say, you shall not work. It seems to be the most important aspect of these holidays. Thou shalt not work. Why is that? Well, I, I guess to make it special, but but um, I, I would think that there would be other, perhaps more important aspects of a holiday important that, that uh, Hashem would want you to think about other than not working. But yeah, I'm obviously oversimplifying. Um, so why do you think that is the case? To, to separate it, to, to make it special. Good. Okay. So, so much of, I think if you go back to the six days of creation with the seventh day of creation, the key, a key differentiation between those six days and the seventh day is work versus rest. So if these are also going to be Mikre Kodesh, holy convocation, sacred moments like Shabbat, and that's why Shabbat starts it, then that's one of the distinguishing features. Good, Ziggy. What else did you notice? Well, I, I think it was the Day of Atonement. Like, if you don't practice or you don't observe it, you'll be cut off from your kin. And I thought that was very, very harsh. You know, it's almost like do it or be banished from the kingdom. You know? Yeah, true. Very true. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how many people have no, well, I guess you always have a choice. But, you know, they, they work on Yom Kippur or they have, you know, they don't deserve it, um, you know. Well, so you're raising another question, which is how seriously do we take the words of Torah in terms of the rewards and punishments that are listed there? Right. Because I mean, I there, are, yeah. there are many, many examples of punishments that are inflicted upon the people of Israel 
if they don't abide by the laws of God. You're just pointing out one of them, and many of those punishments are indeed excommunication and separation from the community forever and ever. Well, I think you have to make a choice between, you know, are you going to continue relationships with your children or your relatives or not if, if, they, don't, if they don't observe the holidays the way you think they should be observed, well, the way the Torah tells you to observe the holidays? Um, I, don't, I don't know. There are a lot of people who are observant who still manage to uh, navigate that with their family mm -hmm. and live pretty meaningful lives holding on to their observance mm -hmm. and also being with family members who are not as observant. Hey, Rachel. Which Rachel? This Rachel? <laughs> she's in two places. <laughs> she's here and she's here. She's everywhere. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. So now you can figure where I must be. <laughs> so how are we going to send her back east after she's experienced this one? That's true. It's going to be a challenge. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Absolutely right. Um, Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm going to share with you um, the text of today, and we're going to be looking at one specific um, issue that the Sfat Emmet points out. Let me get to the top of it, and that is the passages that have to do with the counting of the Omer. Um, so, smack in the middle. After the passages of the Sabbath, after the passages of Pesach, before the section that talks about Shavuot, there is a very long section. <coughs> Whoops, this is a typo. It's not 15 to 15. It's 13 to 15 that says, From the day on which you bring the sheath, the Omer of Elevation offering, the day after the Sabbath, you shall count off seven weeks. They must be complete to Mimot. You must count until the day after the seventh week, 50 days. Then you shall bring an offering of new grain to Adonai. So I don't know if you noticed this section or not. Um, as I was going through and scrolling through the um, Torah. But for many commentators, particularly the Sfat Emmet, this passage raises questions. It raises questions in the context of everything else that's written in this section. Because you, here you have a section that deals with Shabbat, Pesach, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. All of those are called Mikre Kodesh, sacred occasions. And in between, you have a section dealing with the counting of the Omer. And how does the counting of the Omer differ than those other holidays that we just talked about? What doesn't the counting of the Omer share with those other holidays? Or you, you can work. Exactly. The counting of the Omer. They are not Mikre Kodesh. And the whole section of this was 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 um, stated. These are. I'm going to stop and I'm going to um, share again a different part of my screen for you. Um, back to the beginning of the section. Right. Speak to the people of Israel. These are my fixed times. And you shall proclaim them as Mikre Kodesh. So God says to Moshe, I'm going to give you a list of the Mikre Kodesh, the fixed sacred occasions. And in the midst of that, you have the counting of the Omer, which, as Ruth Ann said, is not a sacred occasion. It's not a Mikre Kodesh. We don't avoid work. We don't do any of the other restrictive things on those 49 days that we do on... Um, On the other day. So why is it here? That's the question. Why is it here? Um, what does the Sfat Emmet tell us? He says, 
The days of the counting of the Omer are mentioned within the context of the religious festivals because they are holidays like Chol HaMoed, which have holiness before them and after them, from the exodus from Egypt on Passover to the receiving of the Torah on Shavuot. All these Omer days have an aspect of Shabbat. And when he says Shabbat, I don't think he means Shabbat in per se, I think he means Shabbat as in Mikre Kodesh, days of holiness, days of separation, days like Passover and Shavuot and Sukkot and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Are we clear? Does everybody understand what what uh, is happening here? So I want to dig deeper into the Sfat Emet. Um, why might he say, and what is the meaning of, and what's the correlation between the Omer and Cholamoid? Just from a simple um, shot, a simple level in terms of his first initial approach, why does he call the county of the Omer days like Chol HaMoed? And does everybody know what Chol HaMoed is? Cholam O'ed are the in-between days of Passover and Shavuot. I mean, excuse me, Passover and Sukkot. So if Passover in ancient times was a seven-day festival, the first day and the seventh day were sacred occasions, Shabbat-like holidays, restrictive holidays where you couldn't work, and the in-between days were called Chol HaMoed, literally. Um, uh, Chol is like secular of the festival. So they're still festive days, but they are a step down in terms of the restrictions that we have to abide by. And that happens on Pesach, and it happens on Sukkot. And he's saying the Omer is similar to a Chol HaMoed. Why? Why is the Omer, according to the Sfat Emmet, similar? Stu? Well, it just, on one very simple level, it just strikes me they're like filler. You know, <laughs> um, they're, they're maintaining the structure uh, of, of the holidays, and maybe they add some precision to the timing of the holidays, and maybe there's some value there. Um, but another part of me thinks, um, you know, these are days infused with some meaning by their end and beginning, you know, their, 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 their borders. And, uh, exactly. Very good. So Passover starts right on the first day and then ends on the seventh day, assuming we're in the land of Israel in Hutzla arts in the diaspora, we add a couple more days on each of those, but Forget that. Let's just stay from a biblical standpoint. And the in-between days of the first day and the seventh day are also Passover. And they connect that first day to the last day. So they have resonance to the theme of the whole period. And as Stu said, so too the days of Omer keep us connected to the first holiday and the last holiday. The first holiday that begins prior to the counting of the Omer is Passover. And the holiday that ends the counting of the Omer is Shavuot. And by calling those in-between days Chol HaMoed, what the Sfat Emin is saying is don't look at the festival of Passover ending on that last day. Look at the holiday of Passover extending into the Omer all the way to Shavuot. And normally we think of Passover and Shavuot as two completely separate pilgrimage festivals. Sfat Emin is saying, no, 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 they're not. There's a link between those two holidays and the link between them is the days of the Omer in between. Meaning, again, that just as on Cholamo Eid, we are supposed to be somehow still spiritually connected to the festival, even if we don't practice in the same way. On the days of Omer, we're supposed to be spiritually connected 
to these two festivals even if we don't practice them in the same way. It's a pretty radical idea. And we're going to try to understand and unpack the radicalness of that idea as we go further. Um, any comments or thoughts before we jump a little bit further? I don't want to comment, but I, I'm hoping it doesn't feedback. Okay, I think it's working. Whew. Yes. Ah, uh, thanks. I'm I, I'm trying to remember if I heard correctly or learned correctly. Isn't there something with in our counting that you know you're not supposed to to miss, or then you can't continue the counting? So if if that's correct, then I I, I see kind of how it is really maintaining this holiness element to it in connecting you know, Pesach and Shavuot because um, it's like, yeah, this counting is sacred. I, I don't know if it's true. That's why I was asking it, for clarification <laughs> or it validation. Is um, there is a halachic debate um, where if you miss a day of the counting of the Omer by not counting it, then you're not supposed to, according to one opinion, um, count it again. Um, if you, there's another, you know, position that says if you do miss a day, you can still count it on the next day, as long as you say the bracha, as long as you count it in the morning without saying the bracha then you can say the bracha. And that debate, again, as Rachel is pointing out, has to do with the way in which we view um, the links between Passover and Shavuot and the significance of all of those days in between. George. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Is it working? Okay, uh, I came in late, so I may have missed, you know, this may not make any sense. But the holidays seem to be connected. First, you have freedom, which is Pesach. But then you've got to have some laws. You've got to have structure. Otherwise, you have anarchy. So, uh, you know, to me, there is a connection between the two. First, freedom. And then you've got to have some structure. Otherwise, you won't have a society. Excellent. Right. So that now goes into much more of a... Um, of a... Um, not a shot of the counting of the Omer, yeah. but more of a philosophical or ideological understanding of why did God insist that we connect Passover to Shavuot? Because as George said, it's not enough just to be free from servitude. Yeah. We also have to be um, aiming our freedom towards yeah. a covenantal relationship with God so that we don't end up in total anarchy. Very good. Um, okay. Um, my question, right, is um, what might the embeddedness of the Omer within the list of holidays tell us about the nature of the Omer, which we're beginning to hint at, and what can we learn about how to use these days for personal and spiritual growth? How do we move, as George said, from freedom from oppression to a freedom within the context of a covenantal relationship? And does that just happen by the blink of an eye? Or do we have to go through some kind of spiritual, emotional transformation in order to get to that place? So, Rabbi Smokler. She offers, the days of the Omer are holidays of a sort. They are like the interim days, Chol HaMoed of Sukkot and Pesach. Those days in between big holidays that retain the holiness of the days, but not all of the restrictions or rituals. Those days are quintessentially liminal, not quite Chol, mundane, and not quite Moed, religious festival. They introduce a third kind of time, one that hovers between the ordinary and the extraordinary. So let's just sit with this for a minute. Um, 
what might she be talking about in this paragraph? How do you understand in your own words what she's saying? I think what I, what jumped out at me that I loved is that it makes those days feel mindful or at least in how the practice of mindfulness can go in that, sure, if it were just, you know, regular old day, um, whatever, cool, right? You're just doing things and whatever. But when there's that hint of the, the focus, I love that idea of flowing in between the ordinary and extraordinary because you're like I'm doing stuff like regular but there is some specialness to this and so I'm going to take that intentionality very nice beautiful Rachel Stu uh, well it, it occurs to me sometimes we have a bit of an on off switch in life like Shabbat you are shutting things off but most of our life is lived with you know, things are together, things are infused. And, and somehow this brings together, if I can, uh, on a tangent, a uh, little bit of a story during Nakol Hamoy, this, this past uh, Pesach, we went with our son and grandchildren, and daughter-in-law to um, Zion National Park. And so we're sitting around eating matzot and someone walks by and just bursts. She was so excited to wish us a Chag Sameach. And I just felt well, first of all, at a gut level, it's just a beautiful thing. But secondly, it's like there's there's still a tension. There's still a feeling going on. And you're sort of in a place where you assume the vast majority of people aren't Jewish and they're going to wonder what are these wild crackers that we're eating. But it was like the, the reaction that we got was such a gut reaction. It was like, yeah, there's a certain tension. There's a certain thing that's going on, even in the middle of, of Pesach. And that this spoke to me on that level, too. Beautiful. Love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Leora. I'm actually thinking of the um, mitzvah, the commandment of uh, tefillin, which is an everyday thing, except of Shabbat and Chag. Um, what that um, counting days uh, for me, or the Chol Moed, for me is injecting a little bit more holy into our days before we get to the holiday. Nice, beautiful. So um, all three comments, wonderful ways of framing. If I could summarize perhaps what you all said is, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Planning for a wedding, there's a lot that goes on before the wedding a lot of details, a lot of focus, a lot of mental and physical energy in preparation for that day. And then the day happens and it's a glorious day and people are on this real high level, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Can you then on the next day, just turn around and go back to life as if it never happened? No, right? Because what happens the day after the wedding? We linger in the glow, in the afterglow of that wedding. We have a brunch afterwards, people hang out, the couple themselves will either have Sheva Brachot or go on a honeymoon. They don't just go back to living life as if it never happened. There has to be some transitional moment. And so we have these peak moments of the holidays and then you can't expect just to disappear and just go right back to your normal state of being. You have to, you want to hold on. There has to be a lingering, an afterglow of those holidays, especially if there's going to be another holiday in between. But there's also a recognition that we can't stay in those peaks for all the time. It's impossible to be in that place. So we hold on to those moments and then we transition down, right? And then we hold on to a moment and we transition. And that's kind of like the way life works. Peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Um, and to be mindful, as Rachel said, of that rhythm 
is so important to holding on to some of the that which we gain from the peak so that we can carry and hold on to it in those moments and when we are in a lower spot spiritually. Um, Rabbi, I don't yeah. know if it, oh, I said I don't know if it c comes with age, but I don't find this part of my life as mundane as I found the, the earlier part of my life. I'm just thankful that I get up every morning and I'm here, that my husband's here, that I get to spend time with my grandchildren, that Thursdays I know I look forward to lunch and learn with the rabbi, that I have a class during the week with Rabbi, with rabbi Hoffman, that I have a writing class. I don't know. It's like I, if I knew retirement was going to be this much fun, I might have retired earlier in my <laughs> life. But it's like I don't find... Um, the mundane, so mundane as I did when I was like, you know, running around, you know, carpooling and, and working and like, it's like just in a spin, I, I, you know, I, I, it's not like this grand peak, but I value, I value my time more. Now. I don't know what that means. You know, I don't know if it's, you know, spiritually or I, I found my spirituality now in my life, but. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> um, because only you know, but what I'm hearing you say is that the the way in which you the way in which you occupy yourself in this place of retirement yes. is different than the way you occupied yourself in the midst of work, which can at times be um, tiresome. There's a certain <laughs> slog to the everyday life of having to go to work is you still fill it with peaks. You right. still fill it with moments. Right. They may not be Mikre Kodesh in the way that the Torah understands holy moments, but spending time with a grandchild, doing learning, they separate out and mark significant moments within a span of retirement that allows you to appreciate the time spent in those places. Right, absolutely. And, and I before, think, yeah. And I think in a sense, retirement is cholamo aid. Which means? One could argue that the whole idea of retirement is marked between the moment of, like, let's just say that you say, um, and I don't want this to sound crass, but work. <laughs> And death. You got it. It's not crass. And everything, everything up to work, meaning your education, your schooling, your establishing yourself, your figuring out your career, that's to get to the point of work. And then you work for a period of time and then you die. But now what's happening is we work for a period of time and then we retire. And then we die. And so this retirement can be seen as chola moed, as that liminal period in between birth and death, work and death, mm -hmm. that requires something of us to make it more significant, right. something of us to count it in a way that makes each day count. Because isn't that what we're doing when we count the Omer? We're counting each day to remind us that every day that we have in this liminal space, in this in-between space, can potentially be important. It's not wholly mundane, and it's not extremely festive, but that doesn't mean that it can't be somewhat meaningful. George. Yeah, a question occurred to me. Uh, okay, I get the, you know, the seven weeks are building up to the law, but Shavuot is the only holiday that doesn't have a date. You know, you know, like the first of Tishrei or the 10th of Tishrei or whatever, all the others give you a specific date. Now we can determine it from this, although there, there had been an argument when you start counting, you know, the first Shabbos or the day after the first day of the Pesach, uh, Again, I just find it strange that it's the only holiday that doesn't say, you know, this is the, you know, the date. Indeed, it is. Yeah. 
Any reason? <laughs> well, because it doesn't need a date. Okay. Well, they could say uh, Yom Kippur is 10 days after Rosh Hashanah. You know, I mean, use that kind of logic. That's true. You know? um, and and yeah. as you as you hinted at, there was a debate as to when do you start yeah. counting. When it yeah. says yeah. the day after the Sabbath, the Sadducees said yeah. that literally means yeah. the last day of the festival, and the yeah. Yeah. Pharisees or the, from the or the Shabbos the, after the festival, and or, the, or within could you have it within? No, it at least one. It was after. A, it was after, and the Pharisees the said okay. it is the day after. Okay. The Sabbath, meaning the first holy yeah. day of Pesach. Yeah, but it gets silly in the Gullus because we start counting the Omer and we count the second day as a holiday. And in fact, the, the Mafta reading, you read the same one as the first day. You're saying it, it's not after the holiday when you read the, the Mafta. But uh, it is, and it, you know what I mean? Yes, that's because, as you just said, because there is this additional requirement in the diaspora to add an extra day to the festival, which, in a sense, doesn't mean that we're doing exactly what the Pharisees said we should be doing, yeah. waiting till the after fest of the holiday, which would be the beginning of the third night, not the yeah, beginning yeah. of the second night. Um, let's keep going a little bit. So Smokler says, on this read, the seven days, seven weeks of the Omer are seven weeks of in-betweenness, seven weeks of living between peak experiences, those big miraculous events of manifest divinity, Exodus and Revelation, seven weeks of conscious practice in navigating a world liberated, but not yet redeemed. Seven weeks of marinating in a quality of time that is both of this world and not. It seems fitting to me that the only ritual that marks this time then is an awareness of time. What is she saying here? How would you read what she says in a purely secular manner? When do you have moments in your life that feel like the way that she is describing here? This, yeah, Ruthann. Uh, uh, birthdays. Uh, the actual day of the birthday? What's the in-betweenness? No, the, no the I mean the, the, um, the birthday part. You're aware of time every, as you get a year older. So it's your birthday, okay, the anniversary so, of your birth. Good. So, so oftentimes people live in anticipation of approaching a significant moment. And it's not the moment itself that you're anticipating, or maybe it is, but what is that moment going to be for you emotionally, physically, spiritually, psychologically? right? I'm turning 70. And starting weeks before that, I begin considering what's the significance of that change in status. And how do I hold on to this feeling of shifting, of changing, of whatever it is? Or, right, a grand, you know, a child is pregnant and is due in a certain number of days. And there's anticipation as you count down to that due date yeah. on how your life is going to be radically and forever transformed as a potential grandparent, as a parent, right? Those in-between days are significant in of themselves. And often the only thing that we can do is mark the time to it. Young kids who are going on summer vacation and can't wait, mark the time. Kids who count down to their bar bat mitzvahs who mark the time, right? Those in-between days that are that are made significant by noticing them, by pointing them out, by acknowledging the passing of time to get us to something else are indeed in, in, in their own right significant. Rachel. Yeah, you said a couple of mine, Rabbi, with the like 
people anticipating retirement or a birth. And then I also thought of like, um, I don't do sports myself, but like, you know, even say winning one level and uh, anticipating going to the championship game or like even graduation or, or prom and things that, you know, that season of life brings that you're anticipating it. And I think what we're learning here, as, as Rachel said, is that we don't want to only focus on the moment, the graduation, the moving to the next level, the birth of a child, the wedding, the birthday, those things, the day we retire. We also want to pay a little bit more attention to the in-between times. When we don't, when those could very easily just turn into what L Lauren said earlier, right? The, the, the boredom of routine. We don't want to turn life into the boredom of routine. Mm -hmm. There are any number of examples in Jewish life besides Chol HaMoed and besides the County of the Omer that are in between moments that become significant. And that's what the Sfat Emmet is hinting at in his next comment. He says that after the exodus from Egypt, when we were made to be like little ones just born and rested from the hands of the dark side, meaning the Pharaoh, we must per pursue purification. George, this was something that you, can, you said earlier. You can't just go from Passover to Shavuot. You can't just go from Exodus, from freedom to Torah. There needs to be a period of an in-between time of growth and maturation. That is why the Holy One gave us these days. As it says, you shall count for yourself. This is a gift for our own good that we may come to purity. Now, he's playing with this idea of purity because he's commenting on this word here. To me, to me, moat. To me, moat, it's translated as complete right here, mm -hmm. but it means something else. What does the word Tom in Hebrew mean? George? Simple, but... but it, it, yes, but that's not what it means in this context. Pure. Thank you. Okay. Pure. Okay. Pure. In other words, the days between Pesach and Shavuot are days for you to achieve a state of purification. They are days of transformation. They are days in which we should physically prepare ourselves to move from the Exodus to the receiving of the Torah. Otherwise, we will not be able to accept the Torah in the right state of mind. If I want to get married and I want the day to be significant, I need these days of Tamimiut beforehand, of preparation. If I want to enjoy retirement, right, I need those days of tzmimiut and all of the in-between days. So the Sfat Emmet says that God gave us these days as a way of helping us translate time into potentially holy filled time, not like Shabbat, but still significant. And he throws in and uh, he doesn't throw in, but Rabbi Smokler throws in this beautiful example where she says, well, um, yeah, another moment of in-betweenness that exists in our tradition mm -hmm. is before, when the world, before the world was actually created. Ten things were created on the eve of the Sabbath. So after the six days of creation, in between the moment of the end of the sixth day and the beginning of the seventh day, there was an also a Omer, a Chol HaMoed, an in-between moment. And in that moment, Pirkei Avot tells us, ten things were created by God. The mouth of the earth, the mouth of the well, the mouth of the donkey, the rainbow, the mana, the staff, the shamir, the letters, the writing, the ta and the tablets. 
Some say the demons were also created that day, the grave of Moshe, the ram of Abraham, and the tongs that made the, to make the tongs. So, some of these things I think are very clear. We know what they're talking about. Some of these things maybe were less unclear. The mouth of the earth is the, is the earth that swallowed up Korach when Korach rebelled. Um, the mouth of the well was the water that Miriam brought forth in the wilderness. The mouth of the donkey was Bilam's donkey that spoke. The rainbow was that which God gave in the flood story. The manna, the staff of Moses. The shamir is the snail that supposedly cut the tablets so that the words would be engraved in them. Um, and then the later on cut the... Um, stones to build the temple in um, Jerusalem, the letters and the writing of the tablets, the tablets themselves, the demons that come about whenever we sin, the grave of Moshe is the ram of Abraham, and <coughs> the first tools that were created in order for humans to make future tools to be creative in the world. So, I love the way Rabbi Smokler reads this. She says, It seems that at the beginning of time, after six days of order and differentiation, God created one more thing, liminal time. There was evening and there was morning, and then there was something between evening and morning, something more murky, more mysterious, and positively miraculous. Bain hashmashot. In the midst of this gray zone, this relatively undifferentiated time period, whimsy, beauty, oddity, and creativity were born. Some of the most stunning and strange of the Torah's miracles emerged on the edges of order, on the edges of structured time. What might be she, what, what is she offering us? in terms of how we might look, not just at the counting of the Omer, for sure the old counting of the Omer, but other liminal spaces in our lives, other in-between moments in our lives. What, how might we view those moments for ourselves? Opportunities. Yeah, huge opportunities for something miraculous and mysterious to occur. For most of us as human beings, we like to know exactly what's going on in our life. We like to have plans. We like to be certain about where life is moving, what our direction is, until we're not certain until something happens to us that throws our life into a tizzy, that takes away the structure that we've worked so hard <laughs> to create. Can we approach those places, those moments in our life, as opportunity, <clears throat> as bain hashmashot, as moments for growth, for spiritual reflection, for mindful, um, mindful focus, for exploration of parts of us that we were unaware might exist because we were unaware of it, because we were so focused on the structure and moving from place to place to place and thing to thing to thing. Ruthann. Um, oh, am I muted? No, Am I, okay? no, yeah. we, we um, I think back and I think back a lot to this of when I was at the wall and how uh, it was just against structure and boundaries that I knew, you know, that I operated under. And then all of a sudden I was like in a different dimension. Um, so good. So Ruthann, what you're also notice, noting is not only might liminality occur in time, often it is that's the way in which we view it, 
but liminality may also occur in place, in space. I think that's why we have a mezuzah. The mezuzah is the Bain Hashmashot. The mezuzah is the counting of the Omer. The mezuzah is the Chola Mo'ed. The mezuzah moves us from one space to another space and allows us to take note before we enter into that other space how we might occupy that space, how we might speak and be present to those on either side of the space that we're about to enter. Jerusalem itself is a holy place. Then, Ruth Ann, you're saying that when you get to the Kotel, that transition from the holiness of Jerusalem to an even more holy place, the Kotel, is like moving from the Exodus to Shavuot. And how do we frame our, our walk from when we enter into the old city and actually approach the Kotel to the actually approaching of the Kotel where we hold on and kiss the stones? Might that also be significant for us? Uh, Lauren, did you want to say something? Yes. Um, so I teach a class getting parents ready their children ready for kindergarten and the one thing i always say to them is don't push away time uh, people just push it they push away time it's like push push and i said you know and I've, I've heard this line the days might be long but the years go so quickly so just enjoy these moments whatever these moments are and i think we tend to just push push it you know maybe they should be walking maybe they'd be toilet trained maybe they'd be this sleep through the night sleep da, 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 da. and i said just enjoy take that time sit with your child on their lap read with whatever they're doing even they're bothering you making dinner you know have them help make dinner with you because it's these times just go so quickly so i think goes for everybody just enjoy i sound like probably i have just enjoy the just enjoy the moments because you know whatever those moments are exactly Beautiful, right? Those are those liminal moments. Those yeah. are those in-between moments. We want to, you know, as parents, rush our kids to make sure that they get from here to here. Here to here. here and to when here. they get from here to here, you forget that the in-between place is every bit as significant right. and needs to be held on. I mean, you don't realize when you're going through it, but like looking back, it's like, I wish I had remembered. I wish I had remembered that. <laughs> That's why you get to do it as a grandparent, you know. <laughs> like, you know. So I guess at the end of the day, the questions that um, that Svad Emmett and Rabbi Smokler are inviting us to think about is how do we move from ordinary to extraordinary to ordinary? Um, how do we take the in-between times in our life um, and help us to see the miracles of our daily living? Um, how do we open ourselves up to the possibility of the mysterious, the murkiness, the miraculous in the ordin ordinariness of our lives so that some of that ordinariness of our life may actually be cholamoid, may be omer. Um, how do we think differently about time so that it's not just those peaks and valleys, but everything in between that can be equally profound and moving for us. So there you have it. Um, lunch and learn, I'm complete. I look forward to um, seeing all of you, hopefully, if not before next week, next week, Thursday again. Thank you, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Rachel becoming a bat mitzvah. Yes, Rachel, mazel tov this coming Shabbat on becoming an adult bat mitzvah. Now you are an adult. Shout out to thanks. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Shalom.